Okay, thank you for being in here for this session. I trust you had a good first session and uh, appreciate the opportunity that your pastor has given me. This is called the art of storytelling. I hate to use the word art there in a sense because um, it kind of takes uh, what I believe is a ministerial tool and makes it sound very secular. Um, and anything we do um, in ministry, uh, we don't want to take to some professionalism, uh, some kind of mechanical thing that we can do to get results. That's, that's not what this is about. But um, there is uh, um, a lot in the scripture I think that we can go from as a guide. And uh, I don't um, profess to know everything there is to know about telling a good story. But um, it's effective uh, for sure. I teach this as a class at West Coast Baptist College called The Art of Storytelling. Surprise, surprise. And uh, we teach it for a whole semester. So I'm going to cram it all into 45 minutes if you'll let me. Uh, so we'll move a little quickly. You have some notes there. And uh, I didn't look at your notes this morning, so I, I don't recall all that I, I placed in there as far as filling it in. But I will move uh, quickly through some of it. So if I skip something, don't get mad at me. Uh, just bear with me, and I'll try to keep you on board here. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord to bless uh, this time. Father, thank you for uh, the privilege we have to minister your word, and uh, thank you for the different methodologies that you used as you communicated truth. Uh, Lord, there were times where you used uh, an illustration. There were times where you used an object lesson. There were times when you lectured, uh, you preached, you taught. Uh, there were other times where you used a parable or a story to communicate truth. And so, Lord, we have these options. I believe biblically we can use these same kinds of tools today, and yet we must keep them in the framework of your Holy Spirit being able to work. We don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit. We don't want to become the centerpiece of the uh, message. Your word is the, is the centerpiece. Truth is the centerpiece. And yet the story can expand and enlighten people's hearts and minds. And so uh, help us in this time to learn, and we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Over 2,000 years ago, Aristotle observed that the audience is the end and object of a speech. The audience is the end. A speaker's words are irrelevant if no one is listening. So we've got to get the audience involved. Um, whenever we speak, we have an objective. Guy walks up to a girl. Would you go out on a date with me? He has an objective. Uh, if someone says, can I borrow your car? Uh, they have an objective. When we teach or preach God's word, we need to have an objective. We're trying to arrive at a decision in people's lives. And so communication always has this idea of achieving a specific goal. Now, as a Christian, in our ministry realm, we must understand that our number one audience is God. Our first audience is God. If we don't please Him, it doesn't matter how many people we entertain. We have to please God first. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I was uh, doing a conference in Kansas City, and we had an early morning prayer meeting one day in the choir room. And uh, I got there and climbed up in the risers there for that prayer meeting. And I looked up and above the, the, um, on the wall where the choir would see it, every time they practiced, there was a, a banner. And it said, sing for the audience of one. And boy, that hit me. Now, I don't sing. <laughs> I, I don't, I've never sung in a, well, I've sung in a choir, but they kicked me out. But uh, I'm not a singer. But I've thought about that when we preach, right? Preach for the audience of one. If you please God, he's going to be able to bless the audience uh, that you're targeting and trying to help. So uh, always keep your audience in mind, God number one, and of course the people. So God is always listening. God is always in tune with what we're preaching, what we're teaching, what we're communicating. So let's go through some, some thoughts here with respect to storytelling. Number one, imagination. Imagination. Creativity is a part of God's character. Well, when you think about the creation and how creative God was in the creation, 
I think about the different animals and their functions and what they look like and all those things. God has made a beautiful uh, creation. When I consider the heavens, the, the work of thy hands, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, uh, the, the, God is a creative God. And, and like many of God's gifts to man, creativity is often neglected or it's used in some negative way. Uh, we are creative beings because we're made in the image of God. And so we need to use this creativity that God has placed within us. Many Christians, while they may not use their imagination in a sinful way, allow it to lie dormant and remain undeveloped. And so we need to develop our imagination as we think about communicating truth. So to properly let her be tell a story, you must first see it in your own mind. You've got to see that story before you can tell that story. The more you use your imagination, the less you'll need to memorize. You don't need to memorize a story. Imagine the story, and the story will flow from that imagination. When you see imaginary things as you speak, others will as well. Now, they may see it differently than you do, but that's okay. Pastor mentioned last night, when I tell a story, you remember what color the guy's pants were. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't care if you know the color of the guy's pants. They can be orange, they can be black, they can be whatever color you want. I just want you to understand there was a man in the story, right? So the, the audience may imagine things differently than you do, but the point is you're pulling them into that story. When you express your imagination to others, it's like planting seeds in their minds. And your imaginary pre presentation then allows those seeds to grow. Wordless stories, wordless stories are constantly being told by your actions while you speak. You're telling, I said this in the last hour, but you're saying one thing with your voice, you're saying another thing sometimes with your gestures or your mannerisms. We've got to get those in sync. Wordless stories should be accurate to your words, okay? You, you want to sync those together. If you're holding something in your story, make sure there's enough room between your fingers for that object, you know? If you're talking on the phone, you don't hold your phone like this. <laughs> this is the gesture we use for talking on the phone, right? You ever seen anybody hold a phone like this? <laughs> no, you hold a phone like this, right? Or some people hold it like this, you know, they talk into it. But, but think about how, how far do my, does my, do my fingers and my thumb need to be apart to hold a phone, right? Your audience can't imagine it if, if they can't see it in your hand. So as, as you're imagining things, when I, when I quote Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and the serpent said to the woman, if God said you should not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, you know the story. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, you can see that happening, can't you? You wouldn't say, and she took of the fruit thereof. No, you pick fruit off a tree that's above you, right? There might be some below, below you, but you typically... That would be the gesture that would be proper. And you want your hand to be, if you're imagining an apple, which most people do. I don't know if it was an apple. Probably not. But, but you're imagining that size of fruit. And, and you have to give it a little tug, don't you, to get it off the tree. And so let the audience see what you're saying with that action. Don't rush an action. If you're brushing your teeth or combing your hair or turning a wheel or putting on a piece of clothing... Make sure you allow enough time for that action to be done. Um, uh, think about actually doing it and rehearse that in your mind. Number three, don't forget about how the rest of your body reacts to the activity. If you wiggle your toes when you put your socks on, then make sure you wiggle your toes when you're putting your imaginary socks on, right? Whatever you normally do is what you need to do in this pantomime or this this wordless presentation. Uh, I teach some freshman speech classes, and one of the units that we teach is the pantomime. 
And the, the reason for it is I want students to think about how much their actions communicate. And, and some students will get up and they'll do something, and we're all sitting there going, I have no idea what you're doing. There are other students, the minute they start, you know exactly what they're doing. Why? Because they're mimicking it exactly like you would do it. Now, there are some that, uh, we had a girl one time saddle a horse. And fortunately, I grew up on a farm and had a horse, or I would have been in the complete dark like most of the kids in the class. They, had no, they thought that she was washing a car. They, thought, <laughs> they had all kinds of ideas. I knew she was saddling a horse because I had saddled a horse. But, but the point is that you've got to mimic what you would do in real life. Now, very few stories require amounts of pantomiming, but there will be some opportunity for that. And when you, when you reach out your hand for an imaginary object or you brush aside something in your character's way or, or you reach for something on a shelf, the audience notices how real it looks. If it doesn't look real, they may not come into that story. The audience subconsciously evaluates whether you're talking about a story or whether you're living inside that story. And if you're not in there, they're not going to venture in either. If you're just talking about an event, rather than reliving that event in your heart and mind, you're not going to be able to get them to come in with you. So everything that you do in this creativity, in this imagination as you, as you tell a story, must appear to the audience to be authenticate or real. Number two, facial expression. Our faces communicate life and enthusiasm. The Bible talks about the show of their countenance doth witness against them. When God looked at Cain in Genesis chapter 4, he said, why is that countenance fallen? Have you ever had somebody come say, up to you and say, what's wrong? He said, nothing. I said, no, come on, what's wrong? Nothing. Ah, uh, come on. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. You know, uh, well, how did they know? Well, your face. Your, your face communicated that something was wrong. As a parent, you know when your children's countenance is fault. Uh, you know when they're elated, when they're excited. Our countenance, our face communicates an awful lot. So people need to see the story as well as hear it. They need to see it as well as hear it. And by the way, light waves travel faster than sound waves. So when you're sitting in an audience, you're seeing before you're hearing. It's, it's very bang, bang, but, but you're seeing as you're hearing. And, and, and again, they, they want to see the story as well as hear it. Letter B, the main purpose of facial expression is to communicate the emotions of the characters in the story. Their emotions. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they bitter? Um, there are certainly many facial expressions that can communicate those emotions. Facial expressions help us to show the changing moods of the characters in the story. Surprise, fear, uh, those things can come suddenly in the middle of a story or uh, happiness. The face is able with a simple look to communicate inner conflicts and private thoughts that take writers pages of material to communicate. I, I, I've tried to do some writing. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't profess to be a great writer. I've written 15 books, I think it is now. I'm working on another one. And I'm telling you, one of the hardest things in writing that I never realized until I started writing was writing out a story. Because when you write out a story, you're depending only on words. When you tell a story in a book, it takes pages to write a story that you could tell in 30 seconds because of what you can communicate through your, your face, your body language, and all the rest. If, if you're communicating on paper fear, you've got to describe what that fear looks like. Whereas when you're doing it orally, verbally, you just show it on your face. And, and it's done. People, people understand it. So we have an opportunity to, 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 to communicate so much more uh, live uh, with our face, our mannerisms. Number, letter C, let your face speak. Let your face speak. Slow down, let your face talk. Often good facial expressions can cut your words in half and yet say twice as much. 
I mentioned Dr. Gibbs in the earlier session. Do you know Dr. Gibbs, the lawyer? Dr. Gibbs is an amazing man. I love to hear him preach. I don't have anything on my bucket list. I've never had a bucket list of things I want to do. But I told his assistant one day, I said, if I had a bucket list, I would want to sit in the courtroom and watch David Gibbs work in a courtroom. And he said, I'm going to work on that. So maybe, maybe I'll get to do it someday. I would hate to be on trial with Dr. Gibbs. The man can look at you without saying anything and bring conviction. I hate sitting on the platform when he's preaching. We have him in chapel. He'll preach. And he always looks at the guy on the platform like, you're the one that needs to get this right. And he'll just, he'll just look at you forever. I was in Tacoma, Washington preaching with him, and it was the national championship game was on television. The college football national championship was on, on television. And we had to go to church. And I had watched a little bit of it and went to the lobby. It was raining. We were waiting for a ride. And the game was on in the lobby. And the Florida State Seminoles were in the championship game that year. And I knew Dr. Gibbs was from Florida at that time. And so I, I, I said, Dr. Gibbs, were you, are you a Seminole fan? And he looked at me. And he said, John, did you know that Amazon.com has never made a dime in its existence. And I'm like, uh, is, it, is it my fault? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, am I supposed to do something about that? What does that have to do with the football game? I, I mean, but he just bore a hole through me. To this day, I don't know what he was driving at, but that's what was on his mind. My mind was on the football game. His was on Amazon.com. But but he can, he can make you feel convicted about something you know nothing about, okay? My point is that your face can say so much more than you can say with your words. Fear, for instance, can be communicated by the brightening of the eyes, the licking of the lips, a, a, a difficult swallow, you know, fear. We really can't overdo facial expression for people in the audience to see it, it has to be overdone. Now, again, depending on the size of the auditorium, uh, you know, but in a large auditorium, you've got to make, you gotta make these, these things big. It'll feel awkward first. It'll seem exaggerated, but you can't overdo it. Uh, you, you can't be too big in, in your gestures, in your facial expression. So step out of your comfort zone there with facial expression. Number three, body movement. Body movement. Now, we all have a fear of movement. I mentioned this in the earlier hour. When you first start preaching or teaching or even giving your testimony, whatever, boy, you write everything down. You've got it in front of you, and, and you're afraid to, to move off of that. I, I've gone soul winning with people that have it all written down, you know, and, and they're like, because they don't want to miss anything. And that, that, that's, that shows good diligence and, and, and good preparation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we've got to get to the place where we, we can move away a little bit, where we can get some movement. Movement draws attention. If somebody stood up right now and walked out that back door, everybody would look at them. Because movement draws attention. By the way, if somebody over here stands up right now, walks out that door, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to counter that move by moving this way. So I'm going to pull your attention over here, away from that. Sometimes you're working with children. Some kid will get sick over here, move over here for two reasons. You don't want to deal with that, and, and, and you want to pull the attention, right, away. So movement draws attention. I, I do a lot with drama there at the college. I write four dramas every year. I direct them, and, and we have a good time. But in drama, you've got to have movement. Uh, movement uh, has, to, has to be a part of drama. And so in, in teaching, in preaching, in presentation of truth, movement can be a great friend. So in reality, body movement helps to alleviate the very thing that causes your fear. The purpose of perfecting gestures and stage movement is to draw attention of the audience away from you and to the message. When you move, people think, he's saying something important, I need to listen. And their attention actually is less on you than if you stand in one spot. Because now they're listening to what you're saying. It also helps your body to relax. When you stand in one place, you're going to tighten up. Your knees are going to lock. You're, 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 you're going to get tense. You're going to start shaking. 
if you move, you relax those muscles. So a couple of things that can help there instead of hurt. Now, let it be realized that your body is talking whether you're consciously making that attempt or not. Your body's always talking. In fact, it's talking before you talk. When you come up to the podium to speak, you're already, you're already communicating. If you're walking up like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> you know, I'm so scared. You know, whatever. You're, you're already saying you're not worth listening to. Um, I, I've watched Pastor Chapel deal with some very difficult situations just before church. I, I wouldn't do this personally as a pastor. I've never been a pastor, so I can't speak from that. But pastor will counsel some people, you know, before Sunday night church or before Wednesday night church. It's the only time they can come in maybe. Maybe they're thinking about getting a divorce or whatever. And I, I've been there. I've sat there. And he's, he's trying to help these people in a very intense counseling situation. And then we go into church. But when Pastor walks out on that platform, you would never know that he was just in a very difficult counseling situation. He walks to that platform with purpose, with excitement about preaching and teaching God's Word that night. I'm sitting there thinking, aren't you worried about that couple? You know, aren't you? Aren't, you know, it's got to affect you. But he's able to compartmentalize that at that point. And somehow, no matter how tired you are or what you're going through, when you have an opportunity to speak, you've got to communicate right from the get-go. I'm glad to be here. I've got something to say, and I want you to get it. Uh, not because of who you are, but because of who we're teaching and what we're teaching about. Um, in some cases, number one, your body is saying something different than what your words are communicating. And we want to be careful of that. The audience listens to what you say and compares it to what they see. From your body language, the audience judges your ability, your sincerity, your confidence level, your likability, your truthfulness. Most importantly, they use this information to gauge the value of your message. I was preaching in Hartford, Wisconsin, and the pastor and I came out of a, a back door, kind of like this one, onto the platform, and we sat down. And about the time we sat down, a lady in the church brought a friend, and, and they came in, they sat almost right in front of us on this side. And I watched him come in, and I'd been there a few days, so I knew this one lady was a church member, and the other lady looked like a visitor. They sat down, and the visitor, her eyes met mine. Just, just briefly, I'm, I'm just sitting there, and her eyes met mine. And she leaned into her, her host, the church member, and she whispered something, and they both laughed. And, of course, now I'm feeling kind of subconscious. She just looked at me, and she said something, they both laughed. So the lady got saved that night, which I was thankful for. So after I thought, I have liberty now to find out what they were laughing about. And so I, I went to them after, after we found out she'd gotten saved, and we, we talked to them a bit, and I said, let me ask you a question. You came in tonight, you sat down, you took one look at me, and you laughed. What were you laughing at? And the church member said, she said, boy, does he have a big schnoz. <laughs> Well, I didn't take it, uh, offense to that. Uh, God always gives you more than you ask for. So, uh, but the point is, you're communicating, whether you want to or not. Your clothes communicate, your expressions communicate, your walk communicates. Everything about you is communicating before they even give you a chance to speak. They say 65% of a person's opinion is formed in, uh, in, for, is formed in a person in the first five seconds they meet you. 65% of their opinion is already made up about you in the first five seconds. Now, if you look like me, that's a real disadvantage, right? I mean, some of us weren't born with great looks, right? And people are like, whoa, you know. Uh, so we, we've got to overcome that, obviously, then in the, in the presentation. Let her see hand gestures. Most gestures are accomplished between your waist and your shoulders. That's, that's where your hands generally are. By the way, when you're not using your hands, put them where God put them. You don't have to put them in your pockets. Now, this is a gesture that can be used. I have no idea what to do. Right? This communicates I didn't know what to do. I was completely out of money. I had nothing. Right? Hands in the pockets. So it's not like you can never put your hands in your pockets. It's a good gesture for certain things. But my hands right now look perfectly normal to you. Now, they feel very subconscious to me. I don't like them where they are. They're screaming at me, do something with me. Put me somewhere. 
move me. They're, they're saying to me, do something with me. They, want to, they get fidgety. They want to do something. They want to play with clothing. They want to, they want to come together. They, they, they want to rub each other. <laughs> you know, they, they want to do all these things. When you're not using them, just put them where God put them. They look real natural here. This is where God put them on the body. And so if you're not using them. Now, when you use a gesture, most of them can be communicated between the shoulders and the waist. This is where it's comfortable. And so now, again, you may need to move away from the pulpit for people to see those. If you're behind a large pulpit or a podium like this and you're doing gestures here, they're not very effective, even though they're in the right plane, okay? But most gestures can be uh, communicated here. The worshipful gestures, the powerful gestures need to be above your shoulders. God. God is holy. Um, heaven. Oh, I can't wait for heaven, right? Get those up. I can't wait to go to heaven. I just can't wait to see God. God is so powerful. Now, you're saying one thing with your emotions and another thing with your voice. When you're talking about hell, don't put it up there, right? You don't want to go to hell. In other words, put those below the waist. Uh, children, now, let's be quiet. Calm down. Let's not, let's not talk anymore, right? Negative. Keep it below the waist. So the plane of the gesture can communicate as well. But... but uh, learn to use gestures effectively. You don't have to, you don't have to do, you, you, know, I, you know, I don't know if this is true or not. Italians talk with their hands. Is that true? They say that's true. And, and some people do. I mean, you can be on an airplane. The person right next to you is like, you know, going crazy with their gestures. Like, I, I can see you. I'm right here. Uh, you don't have to use that many gestures. But some people talk with their hands uh, more than others. Uh, but, but work on making them effective. Now, let's get back to the story. Number four, creating a story. Where do we start? How do we come up with a story? Well, letter A, less is better. Less is better. So start with a small story. You must major on being descriptive if you want your story to be gripping and unforgettable. A lot of stories can get long, drawn out. Um, a lot of stories or illustrations contain much more information than is necessary. Someone asked a sculptor, who was uh, carving a lion without a model. They said, how are you doing that? He said, I'm cutting away everything that doesn't look like a lion. You know, we need to do that with our message, don't we? Cut away everything that doesn't apply to the lesson. When you're telling a story, you, you don't have to tell all the detail. Tell the detail that has to do with the point of the story, the reason for the illustration. Um, a lot of stories contain more information than is necessary. Even in a Bible story, take a section of the story and tell it. It'd take you an hour and a half to tell the story of Joseph, but you could tell the story of the coat of many colors in a few seconds or minutes. That, that wouldn't take a long time. So take a section of the story. You want the story to be relevant to specific needs in the audience. The shorter story allows you to focus on that specific target. So you're, you're applying a certain truth, and you're taking that story to emphasize that truth. So make it hit hard and fast. When you strike a nail, you don't want to overpound it, or you'll split the wood. You want to hit it clean. You want to hit it hard. You want to strike it clean and quick, but you don't want to overpound it, okay? Letter B, two important questions to ask when you create a story from a story that already exists. Number one, do I like the story? Do I like it? You cannot generate excitement about something that does not appeal to you. Uh, we have a, a speech minor in the college, and I am the head of that department, and, and uh, the capstone uh, for that program is a speech recital. And our, our seniors have to write their own recital, and then they have to perform it. And when I first meet with them, um, I tell them, now, Whatever you choose, you better love it. Because by the time I get done with you, you're going to hate it. <laughs> In other words, by the time we go through this, or hour, two semesters, three-hour class, two semesters, one-on-one, -on -one, private lessons we call. And if you don't love this story, by the end of this thing, you're going you're gonna to hate me, you're going to hate the school, you're going to hate everything. You've got to love the story. And, and you, you, you've got to fall in love with what you're going to communicate 
for it to have that enthusiasm and that excitement that you want the audience to catch. The story or illustration can be told over and over, so it eventually becomes a good friend. People you don't like make, don't make good friends. So your stories are your friends. You got to like them. So do I like the story? Number two, do I like the ending? Because the ending is where you're communicating that truth. You're getting that, that truth across. And so you've got to love the ending. You can change a large portion of the story to fit the audience or the occasion, but a good ending is difficult to create. It's, a, it's a diff, difficult to adjust the application. So you've got to believe, hey, this story is going to encapsulize what I've been trying to teach. I love this. This is going to bring it to an understanding. A good ending is a non-negotiable element to the story. The ending has to be a winner, even if some of the story is not. Now, Bible stories, number five. We must always look at the needs of the people we minister to in light of God's story and view things through the eyes of faith. When, when I prepare a sermon and I come to a spot where I think I need an illustration, they're not going to... They're not going to understand this like I want them to. I need an illustration. Where do you find a story? Where do you find an illustration? My first thought is, where is it illustrated in the Bible? Could I use a Bible illustration? Um, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. On a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon a throne. He made an oration, he made a speech. And the people gave a shout. They said, it's the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Notice the order. Most people die and then the worms of corruption eat the flesh, not Herod. He was eaten of worms. And then he died. Why? Because he didn't give God the glory. Did anything happen in your life this week you didn't give God glory for? Pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. Now, by using the Bible illustration of pride goes before destruction, you get a double whammy of God's power, <laughs> right? Because he promises to bless his word. So if you're using his word as the principle and then you're using his word as the illustration, wow, you got twice the, the power of the Holy Spirit, Right? So I always think of, 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 is there somewhere in the Bible that illustrates this? Is there somewhere in the Bible that I can go to as an illustration? Now, again, some people, as soon as you go into a Bible, oh, I know that story, and they don't pay as close attention as they should. And that's the negative side of that. But there's a power to the Word of God, as we know. So uh, uh, where in the Bible? When we weave God's Word into our presentation, we are using that which the Spirit of God can empower in a special way. And I talked about Deuteronomy 6 in the earlier session, but God instructed the leaders of his people and parents of children to use stories of the past to instruct their children. He even had them set up rocks, 12 of them, in certain places, so that when the children would see them, they'd say, uh, why did you stack these up here? Oh, let me tell the other story, son. Right? That's why they, they, they built a memorial, so that later they could come and tell the stories. Uh, our, our kids' city building, which is brand new, we have, a, we have a monument of rocks out in front of it that our, our church members all signed and wrote a little note to those kids. It's in a big stack of stones out in front of that, front of that building. You know what? There's going to be thousands of kids that walk in the building. What are those? Oh, let me tell you about Lancaster Baptist Church. Let me tell you about what God did when we built this building. Let me tell you, I, I gave some money to this building so you could come and hear the gospel today. Those stones are there so we can tell some more stories, right? So God did that uh, in, in the Word of God. Uh, letter D, Bible stories are designed to be repeated. They're, they're designed to be told over and over again. We can't look at a rainbow without telling the story of the, the flood and the ark. Uh, every Jewish child grew up hearing the story of how God parted the Red Sea. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, kings told stories. In the New Testament, Jesus told parables and stories about lost uh, sheep, lost coins, lost sons. 
Profound truths can be put into simple terms that everybody can understand through a story. If you stop and think about it, much of the Bible is written in story form. I was thinking about this this morning as I was going through these notes. I hadn't thought about it. The book of Proverbs is, of course, just rapid fire instruction, wisdom, right? I mean, there's just messages in every verse. And, and you think about how many verses in Proverbs talk about being moral, being pure, you know, being careful about, you know, how you conduct yourself with others and so on. And so there's these, you know, these, these pointed little sayings, these, these, uh, the, these um, pithy sayings, as we call them, Proverbs. But then in Proverbs 7, he tells a story. Remember it? About the young man that went out. There was the harlot that drew him in and all that. That story recommits in the mind all those little Proverbs that maybe we skipped over about being pure. And all of a sudden you have a story that you can picture. Oh, I could be that young man if I'm not careful. I could get trapped. I could, get in, I, I, could, I could see myself going down that road. It would be tragic, but I could see that happening, right? And so God stops there in Proverbs. He tells a story about all these things he's been teaching. So again, even, even in Proverbs, uh, it's a powerful tool. Letter E, Bible stories help people connect God's truth with their everyday lives. It helps them to think about what they're learning in their own life. An old Hasidic proverb says, tell people a fact, you touch their mind. Tell them a story, you touch their soul. You touch their heart. Then developing personal stories. The main difference between a personal story and a Bible story or a retold story is that instead of pretending you're there, you actually were there. You get to interrogate the chief witness, you. So get alone with the story. Ask some questions. What did I look like when I was there? What was I wearing? What did, did I have a hat on? Did my, uh, how tall was I when I was six? Uh, what did the place look like? Look up, look down, look around. What did you see there? What are some of the things around you? Were there signs? Was there music? Were there certain uh, smells? Uh, who are the people that are there? What were they doing? What did you smell? The sense of smell is a powerful tool when evoking memories. These are the layer, there are layers of smell. Some are primary, some are secondary. If I start talking about a Thanksgiving dinner, you, but by the time I get done, you can smell pumpkin pie. You, you can smell the turkey in the oven, right? You start talking about Thanksgiving, you can smell certain things. Um, what did you taste when you were there? Remember, children taste more than food. <laughs> as, a, as a kid, we put things in our mouth that we weren't supposed to. So taste is a powerful memory. Now, these questions have taken us through four of the five senses. Sight, sound, smell, taste. Touch doesn't evoke as many memories, but it, it can be a factor as well. Now, once you've engaged the senses, look at the emotions associated with this favorite place. You could probably think of a separate story in that place from each of the following emotions, joy, anger, sadness, fear. Uh, you, you, you could put yourself at a ball game, maybe, maybe going to a, a professional game as a kid, watching a baseball game. You could think of all the smells and the sights and what you were wearing and who was with you and, and all that stuff at a ball game. You, you could go to several ball games. At one ball game, you'd be happy. One ball game, you'd be sad. One ball game, your favorite player got hurt. You think about those emotions that come from that same place. Once you have that raw material, take three steps. Number one, tell your story out loud. Rehearse your story out loud. You've just mined a lot of gold through the recent process. What did I look like? What did I hear? What did I smell? What did I touch? What did I taste? Now you've got you, you, to take advantage of that. You don't have to tell the story to a person. You can tell it to a tape recorder, a tree, or your cat, but tell the story out loud. I, I was doing a Q&A with Pastor Chapel one day for our men, and, and uh, we were just answering questions about preaching and things, and a, a young fellow said, uh, do you guys preach your sermon before you preach it? In other words, do you practice preaching your sermon? And Pastor Chapel said, no. 
Right away, he answered. He said, no. And he looked at me, Brother Gedge. I said, every time. He said, really? I said, oh, yeah. I preach at my office. Every time. I practice it. Out loud. I wait till everybody else goes home. <laughs> and I preach my books. I, I preach it out loud. It's amazing what you find in the sermon you don't want to say. And it's amazing how you think, well, I need to say more there when you say it out loud. Number two, tell your story three times. Tell it three times. This, is, this forces you to do some oral editing. There's some things you won't like in the story. You'll take it out. There's some, there'll be some vacancies there, some holes. You'll want to put some things in. Your thought processes have mined a lot of information, but now all of it, it, uh, it is told well or it, it is necessary. So retelling the story three times helps you to get it down to the bare bones. You, you may not need all of it, so get it down to the bare bones. Limit your story to two minutes each time you tell it. This refines the gold. And once you have it down to two minutes, you can go back and add some detail. Not every story should be told in two minutes. I'm not saying that. But get it down to the bare bones and then add into, thing, into that story things that are necessary. Number seven, avoid memorization and storytelling. Memorizing helps you to say everything just right, but it has several disadvantages. Number one, it limits you in telling the story. It limits you. You can only memorize so much. And so there are only so many stories you could possibly memorize. It's going to limit you. A memorized story has to be constantly reviewed or it's lost. And you're going to run out of room in your brain. And you'll run out of time for all the rehearsals. I, I've memorized over 14,000 verses of the Bible. And I have to review them every week. Or I lose them. So... I spend a lot of time going back over my verses. I have never once spent even 30 seconds trying to memorize a story. I tell a lot of stories. But I've never tried to memorize a story. I let that flow. I can't possibly memorize 14,000 verses and have time to review all that, plus review all my stories, right? So don't memorize the story. That's going to limit you. You're only going to have a few that you can possibly memorize word for word. Memorizing number two doesn't protect you. It doesn't protect you. You, 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 you. you still could forget. You still can draw a blank. And when you do, everybody will focus on what you forgot because it'll be obvious. Let's go down to number eight. Plan your first words. Plan your first words. Think about how you're going to start. A bad way to start is I'm glad to be here today or I've looked forward to coming for a long time. Or, as Pastor said, my name is John, and I'm excited about the story I'm going to tell you, and you ramble on. Um, this isn't the time to wing it. Um, so, uh, look at letter D. Here's some good examples of beginning. Did you know Jesus takes a vacation? Buddy was top dog. When he walked down the street, all the dogs moved out of the way. That's a great start to a story. Every day, she climbed the stairs and walked down the long hallway. At the end of the hall, she would sit on a little seat next to the window. There she would sit sadly, looking over the wall that was behind her house. Well, you, you've got their attention with that beginning. You must pull the audience into the heart of the story within the first few sentences. Then know how to end. Some stories never end. <laughs> We've got to know when to end. A uh, good ending is not they lived happily ever after. Uh, here, here's, a, here's an ending that might stimulate your thinking. Let her see. Every time I read this story or tell it, I'm personally moved because it teaches me how I as a Gentile am to approach the God of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Okay? Think about the ending. Ending the story involves more than words. It involves how you say those words. So let your voice kind of fall. Bring it in for a landing. The, plant, the pilot usually says, we're, we're entering our approach now, and you're, you know you're landing. One of the worst feelings on an airplane is when you, he says we're landing and you don't. You wonder, what's going on? It's been an hour since he said we were landing. Number 10, eliminate needless details. Be careful not to distract with too much clutter. Then add some description that brings life, number 11. 
Um, again, try to stimulate the, the, the senses. I'll, I'll close with this illustration. I'm sorry to skip some of this, but under letter B, number four, here's an illustration of adding description to the statement, I shot the basket at the free throw line. I stand here with the ball in my hand. I feel so alone in a room filled with yelling fans. I bounce the ball three times as I always do. The sweat rolls down the back of my neck. We are one point down and the ending buzzer has already sounded. If I make this basket, our team can still win the championship and I'll be carried off the court in triumph. After that, all new parents in town will name their children after me. If I miss, a security guard will have to escort me out of the building under the cover of night. Our family will have to move to another town. The players on both teams look at me from the two sides of the court. Looks of hope, pain, jeers, glares, encouragement, disdain. I bounce the ball two more times. I know my girlfriend is watching. If I make this basket, she'll be in love with me forever. If I miss, I'll never see her again. Bill Jenkins is probably moving in her direction right now, hoping I miss this shot. I bounce the ball two more times. The referee glares at me as if to say, shoot the stupid ball, my dinner is waiting. I lift the ball into the air and stretch. The tension of my whole body flows through my fingertips. With a jerk, I let the ball leave my hands. It arches high, moving toward the basket in slow motion. It's, it's, it's. I don't know what happened. I faint right there on the court. <laughs> um, so, again, there's so much, as I said, we cover in a semester of this, but I hope it gives you a little bit of an appetite for telling a good story. And your audience will appreciate it. They really will. I, I used to hate it when children would come up to me and say, I love your stories. And I'd say, stupid kid, you're supposed to love the truth, not the story, right? I'd get upset with that. But I thought, you know what? If they remember that story, God will help them remember the truth, right? And, and when you hear a, a good illustration, it stays with you but you remember the truth it illustrated. And so the story can leer, lure, I should say, us in to the truth. And that's what it's all about. Let me pray quick. Father, we rushed a little bit and we didn't get to all, but Lord, I pray that something we said would equip us to be better at presenting the truth that you've given us. Thank you that in spite of how we preach or teach or communicate, that your Holy Spirit can use just your word and we count on that. We pray for that. And, and Lord, but help us to improve the, the things that you've given to us to use. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.